I'm joined by Francisco Gonzalez of Grundislav Games, and we're going to be talking about Lamplight City today. So thank you, Francisco, for taking a little time to talk with us. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, we're happy to have you, and I'm happy to have the chance to pick your brain about uh, Lamplight City. So before we get going too much, why don't you give a pitch for the people watching that haven't heard about Lamplight City? So Lamplight City is a detective game where it's okay to fail, which is basically a short, sleek way of saying that you have to actually do your detective work in order to succeed. Um, I basically wanted to make a detective game that didn't hold your hand and didn't push you towards the right solution. So in order to uh, solve the five cases that the game is made up of, uh, the best way you actually have to pay attention and be a thorough detective and, you know, do your work. Because otherwise you might accuse the wrong person or you might screw everything up and find yourself uh, at a dead end. But the game continues no matter what. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's perfect. That, um, that leads nicely into the first thing I want to ask you about, which is this kind of lack of a fail seat, I guess you could say. Um, right. Yes, you can fail at, at these investigations, you can mess them up horribly, but the game keeps going, like you said. Um, in playing through Lamplight City, um, I kind of find it, find this both incredibly liberating and incredibly terrifying at the same time, and I'm wondering <laughs> why you went this direction. It's not something I've seen a lot of other games try to tackle, especially in the genre. They tend to have a pretty linear, you got to find the right clue at the right time to get the right answer. Um, so why, I have to imagine this was a lot more work for you too, so, so why, uh, why go this direction? Well, I mean, that's, that kind of answers the question, because other games don't do it, and I wanted to see if I could try and, and do it. It actually, I mean, it definitely felt like it might be huge, and I, I mean, I tried to keep my ambition in check, I didn't want to go overboard, because obviously I'm, I'm a solo developer, and, you know, it's just me working on this, so I didn't want to go like super crazy like um but basically yeah i mean i played games like la noir and i played games like sherlock holmes crimes and punishments and what i i mean i loved la noir but i realized that the whole interrogation system is kind of not necessary because ultimately if you fail every interrogation on purpose like i did during one playthrough um you get pointed in the right direction anyway. You, you get given the, the clue that you need to proceed in the case. And, for example, if you get to a point where there's a suspect and you have to do an action sequence like tailing them or a car chase or something, if you fail that sequence, it gives you a game over and you start the sequence again. So I thought, well, what if I could make a detective game where if you were trying to follow somebody and they got away they just got away and that was it. Or if you talk to somebody and you didn't get the information you needed from that particular interrogation and you only had the one chance to interrogate them, then you don't get that piece of information and you have to deal with that. And you have to either find other pieces of information to help you solve the case or you have to accept that you're not going to get that case solved. So. Right. So that, that that was kind of the mindset that I was in as far as approaching the design of the game. And, and yeah, I mean, it was a little bit more work because obviously for each case, um, I, I wanted to have there be several options to choose from because if you closed off one lead, I didn't want it to be a situation where you closed off your lead and that was it, the case was unsolvable. I wanted there to be at least two other plausible solutions to, uh, to to pursue, even if some might be more obviously the wrong ones than the others. I mean, there's some cases where you might just accuse somebody knowing that they're not the right person, but you just don't like them. So you, you want to you wanna pin the blame on them. <laughs> Why not? You know, that's, that's, that's a viable option. You can be a, a bad person. <laughs> A little bit of uh, the, uh, what is it, bad bad side role-playing in that. Yeah, in that exactly. Um, cool. It's cool to see uh, kind of... It, the other thing that I really liked is that it kind of holds the player accountable. It's kind of like you're right. trusting the player to make the, the choices a little bit more. Um, 
it, did that change the way you put together these mysteries in any way? Um, not really. I, it actually made things a little bit easier because another game that I mentioned was Sherlock Holmes Crimes and Punishments, and I like that one a lot because it's one of the more uh, modern Sherlock Holmes games that have been made by a company called Frogwares, and uh, it's it's the second to most recent one. They released another one called The Devil's Daughter, which kind of kept the same mechanics, but I, I didn't enjoy it as much. Um, but the idea was that, yeah, each case also had false leads that you could pursue and suspects that you could accuse incorrectly. Or if you accused a subject, you, in addition to accusing the people, you also had the choice to condemn them or absolve them. And ultimately, that didn't really have an effect on anything. You maybe got an angry letter in the next case from a relative, but... The problem with that was you're playing as Sherlock Holmes, who canonically has been established as this great detective. And so him getting cases wrong just doesn't feel right. Sure. And the game kind of pushes you in that direction, too. Like, by not having these really outstanding consequences beyond just getting a letter from a relative, it pretty much is the game telling you, well, you're Sherlock Holmes, so it doesn't really matter. You've got it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're fine. Yeah, so so taking that element out and just having you play as a detective, I tried very hard to kind of narratively give a reason. Like, at the beginning, it's kind of established, and through talking to characters, it's established that the character that you play as, Miles Fordham, he had been a private or a police detective for 15 years, and he was well-respected, and he was really good at his job. But the situation that he finds himself in during the course of the game, he's pretty mentally strained and he's under a lot of stress. So <laughs> if you as the player screw up a lot, it's plausible that he is going through a rough time. Whereas if he gets everything right, he's just living up to his reputation. So it's it's I'm trying to avoid that sort of disparity between player and player character. Because actually, if I can go off on a little tangent... Um, Please I'm, do. <laughs> Uh, the uh, I made a game, uh, the first commercial game I made was called The Golden Wake, and it was about a real estate, it was a, a historical fiction bit about a real estate agent in 1920s Miami. And uh, I tried a, a little mechanic where you had to persuade people. There were char characters that you had to use your sort of real estate manipulation uh, abilities to, to persuade them. And so I had kind of built up the fact through just conversation and stuff that this guy was a really was really good at his job and it's entirely possible to get every single one of those wrong and continue the game so it, it kind of presents this sort of disparity of well if this guy's so good how did he get everything wrong you know so i, I wanted to avoid that as much as possible in lamplight city and i i hope i did i think i that's been my experience at least um that's good. The one of the ways that that kind of comes through the best, and one of the principal ways you're going to be getting information in Lamplight City, is talking to people and also exploring the environments, just like any sort of mystery game like this. Um, sure. But I was really taken by the way you handle the difference between those, uh, where you'll explore the the environment in a in a pretty standard way, and then when you start conversing with people, you're brought to this separate screen with a very different art style kind of a close-up on people's faces, really well detailed, and that's how you do the conversation. Um, I want to know what drew you to that, because I, I, again, can't help but feel that it was making a lot more work for you in doing, rather than just having the conversation take place in the, you know, exploration environment, right? kind of with the text of the heads. I think it's an incredibly good-looking um, mechanic. I think it works incredibly well, but I wondered why, why you went that direction. Well, thank you. Uh, I wish I could say it was an original choice, but I totally ripped the aesthetic off of a game called Gabriel Knight, Sins of the Fathers, uh, which was an old uh, Sierra game from back in the early 90s. Um, yeah, I mean, I, every other game I've made has sort of stuck to that Sierra Online aesthetic of you have your backgrounds and you have the sprites and the action happening against the backgrounds, and whenever anyone speaks, you get a character portrait with the text. And in the previous games I did, it was mainly a resolution thing because the it, they were very low resolution. They were 320 by 2, 
two hundred. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I could have had the sprites talking and stuff, but it's easier to convey the facial expressions and stuff with the with the close up portraits. Mm. Um, so this game, I mean, the resolution got bumped up a bit to six forty by four hundred, but I also felt, I mean, part partly. I just really liked the aesthetic of Gabriel Knight, and I thought that it felt really well for, or worked really well for a detective game. But also, I thought it was important to keep the wide shots, for lack of a better term, the I guess the exploration mm. scenes when you're when you're basically seeing your sprite and the characters talk with the text above their heads. I thought that keeping that separate from the interrogation mode was important because. When you're in the interrogation mode, you are mostly concentrating on the information that you're getting from asking these characters things. And so I thought that isolating that, keeping that against the black background and focusing entirely on the players and the, the characters' faces and their expressions and stuff um, would help the player concentrate more on what they were saying rather than being distracted by any potential things happening on the screen if you're just seeing the portraits on the main uh, the main screen. And like if the characters have any idle animations or something or they're moving. And a lot of the times too, the, the portraits, like if they appear over the scene, they might appear over the characters and it looks weird. And sure. yeah, I just felt it worked better to isolate it in that, uh, in that black screen. Cool. I, like I said, I think it does work really well. It just kind of stuck out to me as, a, as an interesting way to um, take things. Yeah. Uh, the last question I want to specifically ask you and, and pick your brain about in mm -hmm. terms of the game itself is this world you built, this kind of alternate history 19th century um, city of New Britannia. Um, Britannia. Britannia. <laughs> um, Britannia. Uh, Close enough. <laughs> it, it's a really cool environment, and it's full of all these interesting places, and this interesting commentary on different things. Um, why why build this world, and, and what were some of the inspirations? Well, um, mainly I did it because, like I mentioned before, Golden Wake was historical fiction, and the game I did after that, Shardlight, had some elements of history in it. <laughs> so I've kind of gotten this reputation as being the history guy, which <laughs> I'll take it. Why not? <laughs> um... But I mean, I wanted to make uh, I wanted to make a detective game, obviously that was inspired by Edgar Allan Poe and Charles Dickens, and I felt that making it contemporary to those authors was the best way to go about it. So I knew this was going to be set in the mid nineteenth century, and when you think mid nineteenth century, well, when you think nineteenth century detective fiction. The first thing you think of is Sherlock Holmes, sure. and you think of grim, dark, not grim, dark, but you think of, you, know, you think of shadowy alleys and Victorian London and stuff. Smog and... Yeah, and yeah, and I thought, well, that's, that's a great aesthetic, yeah, exactly, smog and all that stuff, and, and it's a great aesthetic, but I also didn't want to tie myself down with saying, okay, well, I'm going to set this in London, specifically. Right. Or I'm going to set this in New Orleans or any particular specific time period or place. So I thought the best thing I could do was just go with an alternate history <laughs> and cherry pick the things I liked in order to create a new world and a new environment that had all of these elements of the stuff I love so much and that I wanted to convey and the mood that I wanted to convey, um, but not have to be bound by that historical accuracy. Mm. We, I mean, it's not to say that I'm going completely crazy. I mean, there is a bit of a steampunkish element to it, but it's not overtly, you know, it's not top hats and goggles and mechanical no. prosthetic arms. Like, I try to incorporate the steampunk element as sort of kind of just building off the actual Industrial Revolution mm. and idea of like the class struggles and people afraid of this emergent technology it just happens to be slightly more advanced technology than would have been in actual 1844 which is the year that the game is set um and so yeah as far as the city itself yeah i mean i took elements of 
New Orleans, which I love. It's a city I love, and it still feels when you you know when you go there, it still feels like you could be in the 19th century sometimes, in some places in the French Quarter. And again, Gabriel Knight was set in New Orleans, so that's that's a sort of little callback to that. Um, and uh, you know, it's got elements of London and New York, 19th century New York. So so yeah, and and just the tone of it. I tried to stick with that whole sort of macabre sort of Poe tone without going overtly supernatural and just kind of taking the Dickensian idea of really silly names and place names and just that whole sort of the class struggle and that sort of thing. Perfect. Um, That's some great insight into kind of the background of the game, but I'd love to talk a little bit more about your background, and you've, you've mentioned some of the other games you've worked on, but what's the story of that of, of you getting attracted to game development? Um, well, I mean, I grew up playing adventure games. I grew up playing all of the classic Sierra and LucasArts games, and uh, I mean, I, I, I played those on PC, but before that I had been a console kid. Like, I started on the Sega Master System and NES because I'm old, and uh, I had, like... I never really got into, like, I, I used to love platformers, and I kind of got into Dragon Warrior, but um, I had been playing just, like, little adventure games here and there on, on PC, like shareware games, like Hugo's House of Horrors and things like that. Um, and something about just the design philosophy of adventure games that I kind of saw in RPGs as well, but never quite gelled with those, um, I just really liked the idea of going on these quests and finding out bits of stories and helping people and talking to people and stuff. I just, that's just what appealed to me about adventure games. So uh, the more I played, the more I thought, oh, I, I want to make my own adventure game, but I have no idea how. <laughs> so, because, um, I mean, I had never done any sort of coding. I, I did, I made a really dumb text adventure in basic <laughs> in, like, fifth grade because i had a subscription to a magazine that was called 321 contact magazine it was this old science show on pbs and they had a they had a magazine and uh in the back of the magazine sometimes they would have like little uh coding things and one month they had uh all the instructions on how to code your own text adventure in basic yeah and and so i spent like an entire evening doing it and it was this really basic text adventure about you like exploring a haunted house um and when i finished it i was like yeah i made a game but i know everything that happens because i coded it all so i have no one i i'm not going to get any enjoyment out of playing this so i was like mom you want to play my game she was like oh, okay i guess so i had no like i think i got my mom to play it and then i was like well that was fun so then, I, uh, the seed is planted. <laughs> right. So then, years later, a friend of mine gave me a copy of Click and Play, which I still have on my shelf back there somewhere. <laughs> um, which was designed really primarily for platformers and everything but adventure games. But um, but some people had actually made an adventure game. So I I made some really dumb adventure games in it, and then I found Adventure Game Studio in two thousand one. Uh, when I was in college and I had broadband internet for the first time and I was like, wow, I can search for things really (laughs) fast. I googled Adventure Game Maker or something and I found Adventure Game Studio and I saw that people, Yahtzee actually, from Zero Punctuation of all people, had made a couple and like, uh, I mean, there was a little community around that you know, that that had grown up around this engine and like some people had started games but Yahtzee had was one of the first few people that had actually like made fully playable games. So I played some of his games and I was like, oh, if if he can do this, I can do this. So I started messing around with it. And then I just kind of started making games and I got serious about it in about 2003 and I decided I wanted to make a multi-part series about a paranormal investigator that goes around the world investigating different things. Uh, but I wanted to make more of a game... Fo- I guess this is kind of where I got my start in like the history stuff. Mm. 
Uh, I wanted to make a game series where instead of being like a monster of the week type of thing, I wanted it to focus more on actual like local legends and folklore and stuff. Yeah, so it was called Ben Jordan Paranormal Investigator. I set out to make eight games. I ended up making ten because I remade two of them. So technically it ended up being ten games. Um, and yeah, like, he, you know, he went around and like he investigated the skunk ape in the Florida Everglades and like witches in Scotland and zombies in Japan and stuff like that. And it was it was fun. Like I had a really good time making those games as a hobby. And I I made them from about 2004 to 2012. Um, because I had a full-time job later in life and I couldn't work on it full-time. Sure. But they were a great learning experience and I mean, I, I basically got my start doing that and I built up a little bit of a fan base and kind of got trained myself how to do backgrounds and animations and stuff. It was a, it was good pre preparation for sort of being a jack-of-all-trades. Mm. Um... And then, uh, yeah, so like in about 2006, uh, my friend Dave Gilbert, who I had met through the Adventure Game Studio community, he had founded his company, Wadged Eye Games, and started publishing his own games. And then he started publishing other people's games in about 2010. And he had always told me, you know, I'd love to publish something of yours anything any you know and i was like well all right but i'll just need to come up with an idea so then i came up with the idea of a golden wake and uh and he very graciously agreed to publish it so that was how i got my start and that that came out in 2014 um and then yeah i mean i i made the next game shard light and that came out in 2016 and now i'm working on lamplight city which is coming out in six days oh my god september 13th um, yeah yeah awesome that's a that's a fantastic complete overview of of the uh the story of how you got to where you are oh, yeah i was a bit long-winded i'm sorry but no there. you don't have to apologize for that i love kind of seeing the whole scope of things and it's always um even even not as specifically a game dev it's always encouraging mm. to hear people say i had a period where I could barely work on it, and I soldiered through, and it got, it, you know, I got there. That's that's something I think a lot of devs struggle with, especially in, in the current economic environment where it's hard to make a living just doing game development. It's something yeah, that's good just for people. To, just to put it in perspective a little more, like the first three Ben Jordan games I released in one year. The first game took me, I mean, part, part of the reason I remade the first two was because they weren't great. The first one I think I made in about two weeks. The second one I made in about two months. The and then the third one I took more time on. And I would I would progressively take more and more time mm. and make them bigger. Um, but the last one took me four years because at that point I had already, you know, I was already working. I had a day job, mm. and so I'd come home and wouldn't want to work on the game. There was there was points where I'd go six months without even opening AGS. So that's why it took that long. Um, but yeah, I mean, just as a as a cautionary tale, I guess, for other developers. Yeah, I mean, you don't... If you... if I've been very lucky. I'm, I've considered myself very lucky that I've been able to do this as my full-time career for the past few years. And, you know, depending on how Lamplight City does, hopefully I'll be able to continue doing it for long, a little bit longer. Uh, <laughs> We certainly hope so. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, as far as, you know, there's, there's, it's definitely understandable that if you are working a day job, you're not necessarily going to want to work on game stuff afterwards, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't beat yourself up over it and think, oh god, I have to, I have to do this, or kill yourself over, you know, oh my god, I have to work on my game. <laughs> so. Um, the last thing, you, you kind of already mentioned a bunch of the influences on... Mm. Uh, Lamplight City, but are there any kind of surprising influences you, you want to kind of let people know about? Uh, I mean, I already said Gabriel Knight is like the biggest one, and Sherlock Holmes, obviously, and L.A. Noir. Um, and yeah, Poe and Dickens. Um, pretty pretty well, solid set of inspirations, honestly. Yeah, for, for a long time before I came up with the title, it was actually the code name was Poe Dickens, and that's, <laughs> that's what I referred to it as for a very long time. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm. I can't really think of anything 
out of left field that people would be surprised to know was an influence. Fair, fair enough. Um, <laughs> and then final question we always like to ask devs is what other indie games or indie dev team projects are out there now that you're, uh, you're, you think are innovative from your perspective or you're really excited for? So uh, there are quite a few, but I will name check two of them. Mm-hmm. One is a game that's being made by a friend of mine named Nathan Hamley. He goes by Chicky or Sick Chicken Studios. It's he's making an adventure game called Guard Duty, um, which is a cartoony adventure about. Uh, I'm actually not entirely sure how it works. I think it involves time travel, but it mixes cyberpunk future dystopia with medieval fantasy. Well, I'm officially intrigued now. Yeah, because... and it looks. It, it looks beautiful. Like it's got this great cartoony style, um, and yeah, he's been working on it for a while. I think he hopes to release it later this year. Um, actually, I'm going to name check three. Oh. Uh, yeah. So there's that one. There's also Gibbous a Cthulhu Adventure, which is being made by a team from Transylvania, and it's a cartoonish again cartoony uh, comedy about this guy who. There's cults in it, and there's Cthulhu in it, and there's a talking cat, and it looks gorgeous. Um, and they are also they've also been working on it, uh, and I think they're getting pretty close to release as well. Cool. And then there's a guy named Joe Richardson is working. He just uh, kickstarted a sequel to a game that he made recently uh, called Four Last Things. His current Kickstarter, uh, the game he's he's kickstarting now is. Procession to Calvary, which is the or Cavalry, which is the the game he just finished kickstarting, and his games are really cool because what he does is he takes actual Renaissance paintings oh. and he he cuts them up oh. and he makes them look like Terry Gilliam style animations. Oh, yes. So you're like you're you're this guy and you're just walking around these like amazing looking medieval landscapes and like Hieronymus Bosch esque paintings. Um, and it's a point-and-click adventure game. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, those are, those are three projects to keep an eye out for. Yeah, for absolutely. Sure. Those are three great ones for people to follow up with. Awesome. Well, Francisco, thank you for taking some time to talk about your background and kind of the design philosophy of Lamplight City. As we mentioned, it's coming out on September 13th, and we'll have links in the description below if you want to go find it and wishlist it, or if you're watching this after the fact, get a hold of it. So, uh, again, thank you for taking the time. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.